There we go, right on cue. Hello and good evening everyone and welcome to the final uh, seminar of the term for the 2022-2023 Institute for Northern Studies Public Seminar Series. It's lovely to see lots of familiar names in the audience tonight and a warm welcome to those joining us for the first time. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr Andrew Lind. I'm a lecturer here at the Institute for Northern Studies and it's my pleasure to be chairing these seminars. Now, as is tradition, uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I have my usual mantra of, of kind of technical information that you can choose to listen to or zone out of for the next minute or so. Firstly, I just need to make everyone aware that tonight's session is being recorded, hence the, the scary robot voice at the beginning there, and it will be available to watch on the INS YouTube channel, so you can relive the whole experience at any time you want. The second and final point I need to make is that uh, if you want to submit a question and you're free to submit any questions at any point uh, during the presentation tonight, please do so via the chat function on your screen. So please don't use the Q&A function, make sure that you're using the chat and make sure that you address all panellists when you send in your questions. And that just means that we can all see it and uh, it means none of these questions will fall through the gaps. Now, tonight we've got a very special seminar and it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Annie Dusen. Dr. Dusen graduated from the Institute for Northern Studies earlier this year with a PhD on the role of Norse heritage and tourism sustainability in Orkney. She also holds an MA in social anthropology from the University of St Andrews and an MA in journalism from the University of Aarhus in Denmark. She has worked in the heritage sectors both in Denmark at the Musgard Museum and in Orkney where she's currently employed at St Manclus Cathedral. Tonight Annie will be sharing some of her doctoral research with us in our paper titled Developing the Visitor Appeal of Orkney's Norse Heritage Sites A Route to More Sustainable Tourism? Question mark. Over to you Annie. All right thank you very much Andrew. I'm just gonna attempt to share my screen. Here we go. Okay. All right, does that work? Can you see that? Yep, that's great. Perfect. Yeah, so as Andrew said, I recently finished my PhD from Institute for Northern Studies here in Orkney looking at the potential use of Orkney's Norse heritage to increase the tourism dispersal in Orkney and thereby the sustainability of the tourism situation that we have here. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight, really. Um, I know most of the audience will be people living in Orkney. Some of you might even have interviewed for this research. So what I tell you will probably be familiar territory for many of you. But I'm hoping that I'll be able to take us a step further in our discussions of sustainable tourism here by pulling together the various problems and potential solutions we may be facing in terms of dispersal, but also putting it sort of in a wider academic context to learn from other places and, and other work in this field. So first of all, I'll very quickly go through the background for my research. Uh, the concern with tourism dispersal here in Orkney really arose out of the situation that we've seen over the last 10-15 years, where tourism has really increased quite, quite dramatically, especially cruise tourism. As you can see here on the graph, um, it's almost quadrupled between 2011 2019. Non cruise tourism has also gone up, not as dramatically, but still with about 35% between 2013 and 2019. I'm not going to be talking about post 2019 situation today, all the COVID stuff that that's a whole thing apart. If you want to talk about it, you can ask in the questions and we can go into that. But what has happened? With this tourism increase, as in most destinations, it has had a lot of positive impacts um, on Orkney. It's also had some negative consequences. And a lot of the negative consequences has come from the fact that the tourism con um, concentration is also quite high. So the tourists tend to go to the same few places and the, the same few uh, attractions really in Orkney. Um, and also within a relatively short season. Um, and that does create a number of problems. So, for instance, some of our heritage sites suffer from erosion, which is partly due to the footfall. Um, so that's Scour Bray, for instance, Wingabrodka. And many places we also have issues with uh, congestions, queuing, insufficient infrastructure and so on. And that's uh, a cause of frustration sometimes for the visitors, but also, also for the residents here in Orkney. Um, so that has created an awareness of the desirability of better dispersal of tourists here in Orkney. 
Um, so, for instance, it, this is part of the uh, Orkney Tourism Strategy 2020 to 2025, which was um, published by Destination Orkney Partnership. So you can see a quote from that here where it says that to embrace growth, there's a clear necessity to both temporary and geographically disperse visitors to less visited attractions and areas. Um, so that was a situation which really formed the background for my PhD project. And my research aims were twofold, as you can see here to the left. First, I wanted to consider whether and under what circumstances it would be possible to increase the appeal of Orkney's smaller North Heritage sites, because at, at present they play a relatively minor role in our tourism landscape. So if we could make them more appealing, we could move more of the tourism pressure towards them and away from, from some of the, the more intensely used sites. Um, towards the, the, the smaller north sites, but also the areas in which they're located. Second, I wanted to consider whether by doing that, whether creating this increase, increased dispersal would in fact increase the overall sustainability of Orkney as a destination. Because obviously it could be the case that these areas and these sites were in themselves, for instance, um, really environmentally vulnerable, or in areas where there's really limited infrastructure. And if that's the case, then you just move a problem from one place to another. Um, so that was what I was looking at. And the research uh, question, the research methods I used to look into these questions were, as you can see there to the right, documentary analysis, um, observation, structured and participant observation. And I carried out uh, about 75 uh, stakeholder interviews, uh, semi-structured stakeholder interviews, mainly with stakeholders in Orkney, but also some uh, outside of Orkney. And I focused on six case study sites, all relatively small North Heritage sites. Um, but apart from that, they were kind of chosen because of the variety they offered, both as relates to their position within Orkney, uh, their location, and also in terms of the issues that they raised in terms of their visitor appeal issues and in terms of sustainability. So the first site, you can see there, number one, that's Earl's Boo and the Round Church down by Orpha. Then there's the settlement on the Bock of Deerness and the East Mainland. And then number three, I took kind of three small sites together, uh, three small heritage sites, which are all located in Westness and Rousey. Number four is the St. Magnus Church and Aglesey. Number five, the Croigu Settlement and West Street. And then St. Boniface Church, number six on Papa West Street. So those were the, the six sites. And I want to first talk a little bit about the sustainability aspect of it. So regarding whether increased tourism dispersal would in fact increase your overall sustainability of Orkney as a destination. But before doing that, I kind of have to clarify what I mean when I talk about sustainability, because it's a very wide concept and it's used in many, many different ways in policy and in scholarship. So in my thesis, I work with the four-thronged concept of sustainability. I'm talking about environmental, cultural, social and economic sustainability. Again, these are used in very many different ways. So I just try to put some very short definitions up here, which work quite well in terms of tourism and work quite well in the context of, of my particular project. So if you see the environmental sustainability, I've defined as a situation in which harm to the environment is minimized and economic incentives to protect the natural resources are provided. Cultural sustainability is where the present generation treats the cultural properties in a way so that future generations can equally understand them or live their meanings and values. Social sustainability is where developments are of a nature so that communities can absorb them or adapt to them without the creation of social disharmony. And economic sustainability is understood as a situation in which development supports a healthy economy and assists residents in meeting their economic aspirations. So, on to the findings. If we start with the environmental sustainability, my findings suggested that increased tourism dispersal to the smaller north sites and their surrounding areas was actually likely to increase the overall sustainability of, of Orkney as a, as a destination. Um, and that's because increased dispersal would lower the pressure on some of the sites that are presently suffering from, for instance, erosion. And uh, so that would be, for instance, the, the World Heritage Sites, as I said in the beginning. And at the same time, there were no major issues foreseen in the case study areas if, if tourism were to increase to these areas. Um, so because the north sites that I investigated, they were all quite robust sites. They could take a substantially higher footfall without any risk really to the remains. And there weren't also any evident environmental risk to the wider areas, even in the cases where 
those were protected nature areas. So in some cases, they were, for instance, RSPP reserves and so on. But, but they could all take higher visitor numbers. However, I would say in terms of environmental sustainability, I also found that there were some quite important caveats to my findings. So for instance, I happen to have six case study sites, which were all really environmentally robust. But I also found that I couldn't really generalize from that to all of Orkney's smaller north sites. Um, so for instance, in this picture, you see that's Cobby Roos Castle on Wire, also a small North Heritage site, which is arguably undervisited uh, in terms of, of Orkney's tourism. But that wasn't one of my case study sites. But unlike all my case study sites, this is actually an environmentally vulnerable site in the sense that it's quite, it's a very soft site. So if you had a big tourism increase to that, if you had many more visitors, that would be a problem because of the footfall. Mm, so, so you have to be a little bit careful about that, about generalizing from the findings here. Also, it can be quite difficult to discern what the environmental impacts of tourism actually are in areas which at present have quite low tourism levels, uh, as most of the, the areas in question did, uh, especially because the environmental impacts of tourists are often the same as those of residents. You know, everybody creates waste, everybody creates sewage and so on. Um, and so, for example, it was only at the very end of my research that um, that I realized just in casual conversations that some of the North Isles have real issues with them um, getting rid of their recycling. And this is actually a really relevant matter in terms of environmental sustainability and island tourism, um, because if you increase tourism, you exacerbate that problem. Um, but it just never came up in my interviews because understandably it wasn't really something that um, people on the islands necessarily connected to tourism. Um, so it, it just ended up being a blind spot in my research and not necessarily the only one. So in summary, in terms of environmental sustainability, there was a good case for dispersal using the North sites, but there were some caveats just given the actual nature of the, the research, me research methods used. Next area was cultural sustainability. Again, um, the case for increased dispersal to the north sites was very good uh, in terms of cultural sustainability, because first of all, as I mentioned, the actual remains at these sites were generally found to be able to withstand an increase in visitors without detrimental effects. Furthermore, I found in several cases that an increase in interest um, to those sites, the smaller sites, would improve the likelihood of of preserving both the tangible and the intangible heritage, heritage of these smaller North sites in the future. Um, so there's been a lot of attention in the scholarship paid to how tourism to heritage sites risk over commodifying heritage, you know, this whole idea of a uh, process of disnification. And obviously that is a culturally unsustainable process because it, it will misrepresent what the heritage is actually about, you know, if you popular, popularize it too much. But actually, for the vast, vast majority of heritage sites in the world, they're in much more imminent danger of just being forgotten than, than of being over-commodified. Um, you know, because if, if they're forgotten, that means nobody maintains them. So that's a danger for the, for the tangible aspects, you know, for the actual remains. And also it means that all the meanings and all the values that are attached to them, so the intangible aspects, um, they just disappear over time, you know, because they're forgotten. So, so it is an actual danger to the sites. For these six case study sites, in most cases, they weren't forgotten in that sense. But in some cases, it was definitely the case that there was a lack of ongoing attention to the sites. That meant that the interpretation maybe didn't really work to perpetuate the fullest and the most accurate sense of the site's history and meanings to, to time. Often the information offered was outdated. It wasn't really in line with the latest archaeological findings. Sometimes there wasn't any interpretation at all. Um, that's, for instance, the case on the on the site you see here on the picture. So this is actually, again, this is on Westness and Rousey. It's a very uh, archaeologically important site. It's a picture's North Cemetery, and there's a North Noose as well, and a farmstead, but there's just no interpretation at all. However, the six sites I looked at, they differed very significantly in this respect. And it's important to note that the, the fullest and the most multifaceted sense of the sites and of their functions and meanings and values through time, they were offered when the immediate community played an active role in presenting the site. So for instance, by offering guided tours of the site and, and things like that. 
So if rising visitor numbers could make it economically and socioculturally meaningful for more initiatives of these to develop around more of these small sites, smaller north sites, for instance, that could definitely improve the, the cultural sustainability of these sites and just make sure that both their tangible and intangible aspects were preserved over time. Third, social sustainability. This is a rather more mixed picture emerged here regarding the social sustainability of, of dispersing organized tourism to the north sites. Um, the most significant finding in this category was that social attitudes differed a lot depending on whether we talk about volume tourism or non-volume tourism. Uh, for those of you who live in Orkney, this is probably not going to be a big surprise. Um, so the situation was that in most case study areas, there's a general preference for at least a modest visitor increase. Um, so that in itself would suggest that dispersal was recommendable also in a social sustainability perspective. However, a dispersal of the volume market, which in Orkney's case overwhelmingly means cruise tourism, is a lot more tricky because there's much less consensus about the desirability of more cruise and coach tourists um, in, the, in the case study areas. And that means that a potential increase of this could result in, in social disharmony. Um, so I found two overarching factors that made residents or some residents weary of an increase in, in volume tourism uh, across case study areas, really. And those two factors were infrastructure, the effects of infrastructure on infrastructure, sorry, and the effects on sense of place. By, by volume tourism. So infrastructure issues related to coaches really, uh, and the fact that most roads and inter-island ferries in Orkney are just not geared to coast, coast traffic. And so coaches cause congestions and, and other irritants for tourists, uh, for residents, sorry. Um, so for instance, I have a photo here of the Iron Hallow, which is the inter-island ferry that serves uh, Rousey, Eagleson, and Wire. Occasionally it takes coaches of course to Rousey, and that definitely led some Rousey residents to complain that these coaches, they make the ferry go slower, they take up too much space, they cause delays because they need these wooden blocks to be put down for the, uh, for the coach to get on and off the ferries. So there were also suggestions that ferries be banned altogether from uh, uh, that coaches be banned altogether from the ferries. So they were very unpopular. And I think it's interesting to compare that with the attitudes to non-volume tourism, because non-volume tourism, in fact, also causes disruption, especially to the inter-island transport. Many residents on the on the smaller islands experience overbooked ferries and flights throughout the summer, not because of volume tourism, but because of independent tourists. But when people were frustrated with this, I never heard anybody say, we don't want them, we don't want these tourists, in the same way that they would, for instance, say, we don't want the coaches. Instead, they turn their frustrations towards the providers and say, we need bigger ferries or we need better ferries and so on. Um, which again, I think underlines the difference in attitudes towards these, these two kinds of tourists. Um, and I think this difference may partly have to do with the impact that volume tourism was felt to have on sense of place. Um, and I think this is actually a key point if we are to understand the very different attitudes to cruise tourism in Orkin community as a whole. Uh, people just fundamentally di disagree on how they want the place they live in to look and to feel. Uh, and that was also the situation in the communities that I was looking at. They were just kind of microcosmo cosmos versions of Orkney as a whole, really. Um, so key words for many residents in describing how they would like the areas they lived in to be seen were words like peaceful, quiet, personal, unspoiled these kind of concepts. And so they wanted visitors that would appreciate these kinds of qualities rather than visitors that would challenge them. And cruise visitors were seen to challenge notions of tranquility and personal connection to space, primarily just due to the fact that they came in bigger groups. Um, sometimes this was a concern, not just in terms of the sense of place of wider areas, but in relation to the actual sites, the actual heritage sites that I was looking at. Um, because some of the sites were used for religious purposes or they stood within active churchyards, all churches standing within active churchyards. And some of the resident use of these sites were quite weary of a potential rise of tourist groups. Not tourist as such, but tourist groups specifically, because these groups were seen as creating an atmosphere that was 
opposed to the spirit of peace and the spirit of reflection, which they would like to see equivalent in these kind of places. Um, so, although the general goodwill towards the tourism increase in the case study areas would suggest that an increased dispersal was socially sustainable, dispersing the cruise audience um, specifically might just diffuse to a wider area a cause of, of social conflict, which is still quite prevalent within, within the Orgy community as it is. Lastly, there's economic sustainability. This is important uh, because an, uh, one of the biggest arguments really for increasing tourism and dispersal in Orkney has also been that the income generated from tourism ought to be better spread out throughout the archipelago. But this is a bit of a tricky argument because you can't really generalize that more tourists to an area automatically means improved economic turnover. It really depends on the type of tourism and it also depends on the area. So for instance, um, from my data, I could see that in the Orpha area and also on Eaglesea, uh, an increase of day visitors wouldn't really make much direct economic impact because there just aren't any businesses in these areas that will benefit from it. That doesn't mean that there aren't any indirect impacts, um, socioeconomic impacts. So on Eaglesea, for instance, many residents pointed out that without tourists, their ferry provision would be in a much more precarious situation. And poorer ferry provision would certainly have negative socioeconomic impacts for residents. Um, it would make it more difficult, for instance, for the farmers on the island to uphold their business. It would also make it harder for people who live on Eaglesea to, to work on other islands and, and so on. Um, so, so it was very important in that sense. It was just an, an indirect effect. Mm -hmm. At the same time, on several of the other islands, it was evident that seasonality, the effect of seasonality, somewhat limited the extent to which communities would actually benefit economically from a further tourism increase. And that's because realistically, that increase would probably happen in the main season. And in the main season, the accommodation and the food and drink providers on many of these islands are actually already to full capacity. So you know, they're, not, they're not going to be able to make any more from a, from a tourism increase. And that actually takes it back to this quote from the tourism strategy, which really stresses that dispersal should be geographical and temporal. And, and this example just shows that these two kinds of dispersal really should happen in tandem for them to be efficient. However, I also have to mention that research in other destinations similar to Orkney, by which I mean small peripheral cold water islands, suggest that overcoming seasonality in this kind of destination is just exceptionally difficult. Um, we experience a pronounced seasonality that we do, mostly part, mostly due to weather conditions, which again will not surprise you, also due to the difficulty of access. So access plays a role because people's out of season breaks are usually quite short. So many people choose destinations which are not too time consuming and difficult to get to. Um, also, it's harder for rural areas uh, to overcome seasonality than it is for urban areas because the tourism offer is less diversified. There are less indoor things to do, for instance, uh, in, in bad weather. And all of these things that make seasonality hard to overcome clearly apply to Orkney. You know, we, we're difficult to get to for most of our target markets. You know, we have the bad weather. We don't have that many indoor activities and so on. And they especially apply to our small islands. Um, so I think we might also have to realize that there are some things we can do, but it will be rather limited how much we really can do to extend the season and overcome the seasonality that we're experiencing. You know, we will we will reach a, um, an upper limit for that. So if this section on economic sustainability maybe seems a little bit confusing, it's because there isn't really a clear cut answer as to whether increased dispersal to the north sites and the surrounding areas will increase the economic sustainability of our tourism. Rather, what my findings suggested was that it's really very case dependent whether and how an area may benefit economically from an increase in tourism. Um, and this should be considered in our destination policy. We can't assume that tourism dispersal automatically means the dispersal of, of tourism income. So to sum up the sustainability findings, um, the findings regarding what the increased use of north sites might do to the sustainability of the tourism situation, could look something like this. 
Um, so increased dispersal to, to the less visited north sites is likely to lessen the environmental impacts at some of our most busy sites without creating fresh environmental issues. It would strengthen the cultural sustainability of some of our uh, small and less visited sites and also strengthen the socioeconomic sustainability, at least some of, in, some of our um, more peripheral communities. Uh, as we've seen, however, this comes with important caveats, which underline that all these different islands and communities really have significantly different needs and interests and have to be considered on a case-to-case -case basis in terms of how they may benefit or otherwise from tourism. Also, um, it has to be realized that not all sustainability issues can be solved through dispersal. Um, so cruise tourism is a cause of social conflict in Orkney and dispersing it, for instance, by sending more of the smaller cruise ships to more of the uh, smaller islands, may well mean that we just export that, that conflict we're experiencing to, to more areas. The whole discussion about the sustainability of dispersing tourists isn't very relevant, however, if the tourists are not willing to disperse. Um, so that leads to the other aspect of my research, namely whether and how the tourism appeal of these small North Heritage sites could potentially be increased to attract more visitors. Again, the sites and the areas they're in are quite different, um, but there were some overarching patterns that are discernible and that I want to talk about a little bit. First of all, it wasn't particularly difficult to see why these sort of small and North Heritage sites were challenged in terms of their appeal, in terms of attracting visitors. Um, they all have a low level of supporting tourism infrastructure, by which I mean really any facilities at the site that assist visitors in understanding the site or just serve other visitor needs. So at the North sites, for instance, you, you typically may just have an interpretation board and a bench, something like that, and that doesn't really compete easily with our bigger sites here in Orkney, where you might have you know, on-site guides, toilets, shops, other activities. Also, they tended to be small sites in terms of the tangible remains. They had to had quite few tangible remains there. Uh, and those remains were not necessarily particularly evocative. Um, so you might have something like the work here, which you can see, that's, um, that's a site on, on Rousey, where it's not even very clear what kind of structure you're looking at. Um, so, so that was an issue as well. And then they were often in peripheral locations, or at least in locations which were relatively difficult to access. Oh, so those characteristics together create a situation in which visitors may need to invest quite a lot of time and energy in accessing the site, while getting fairly little return from it, in the sense that the lack of assets and tourism infrastructure means that visitors typically won't spend a lot of time on site or engage with, with the site in depth, unless they have an expert level of interest or understanding of the site. Um, and that just decreases the site's appeal. This can be significantly helped if you use the, the wider attractions environment efficiently. But here I found some, some challenges too. So that's the fourth aspect we we'll look at that you can see there. But if we start with the first one, which is the um, lack of supporting tourism infrastructure. So heritage tourism today is for everybody. People don't have to have any particular knowledge or even interest in history of archaeology in order to want to visit heritage sites. It's just a normal part of being a tourist. Um, in fact, most heritage tourists don't have any such expert knowledge. This hasn't always been the case. That's kind of a development that's happened within the last 50 years. And it's great. It's, it's really democratized access to, to heritage. But it has also affected what visitors expect from heritage sites. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting water. Because these less specialized visitors generally expect more interpretation and also more secondary activities like gift shops and so on. And it also takes more to keep their interest and to allow them to imagine what a site was like in the past. They just they need more tourism infrastructure in, in, part, in, in short. Uh, some of our sites in Orkney are very good in this respect. As I mentioned, at least in the season, you have on-site uh, guided tours at all the major monuments. We have a couple of shops, and in, in the case of Scarrow Bray, there's even a reconstruction of the site that you can enter and a visitor center and so on. As I mentioned, at these small north sites, 
there's much less of that kind of thing. So Troy Gould, for instance, which you can see in the photo here on the settlement on North Settlement on West Street, didn't really have any other tourism infrastructure than a single interpretation board. And there are a number of reasons why there are these kind of differences in investment in infrastructure at different heritage sites. Um, partly it's a question of ownership and management. Many of the small north sites have owners which do not really have tourism as a key priority key priority or do not have the resources to develop more tourism infrastructure. This site, for instance, Koi Gru, it's owned by the farmers who own the land it's on. You know, they're not a heritage body. They're not even a public body. There's no obvious reason for them why they would invest in tourism infrastructure on the site. However, it is also a question of political prioritization, because many of the North sites are actually owned by the public heritage bodies like, you know, Orkney Islands Council, Historic Environment Scotland, and they evidently prioritize their investments in tourism infrastructure between different sites. Um, so both organizations, for instance, were underwriters on the project, which has directed, I think, 6.5, Orkney 6.5 million tourism component of the island's growth deal, all to, to the heart of Neolithic Orkney. Uh, partly to make tourism to that area more sustainable, which is um, really needed, but also to improve the interpretation and the visitor offering at the heart of Neolithic Orkney, which naturally will make those already extremely popular sites an even more central pillar of our tourism landscape, instead of diversifying the picture. I'm, I'm not saying there aren't good reasons for this. Obviously, both Historic Environment Scotland and Orkney Islands Council, and also Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which is the third partner in this project, have a range of other priorities than tourism dispersal, and so they should have. And those other priorities may be better served through this fairly narrow focusing of investment. I'm more just kind of pointing out that in order to improve, if we want to improve tourism dispersal, that's going to be really difficult if the central stakeholders don't challenge the status quo in their investment patterns when it comes to tourism infrastructure, because tourism infrastructure has a lot to say um, in terms of where the visitors choose to go. However, you can also choose to look at this um, in terms of the demand side rather than the supply side. Um, so, as I mentioned, the majority of heritage tourists have relatively high expectations to tourism infrastructure, but tourists do come in all guises and there's certainly some niche groups who prefer a raw site, so to speak, a site with less infrastructure and finds that more appealing. And in many cases, those will be the same people that are attracted to go to the smaller islands because um, these have less facilities, they have less conveniences. And so that's considered more for these particular groups, that's considered more authentic and more sort of adventure like. Um, so if we chose to prioritize these groups in our tourism planning and our marketing strategy, that could certainly also be expected to improve dispersal in itself. So that's also something we could be looking at. Um, and I think actually that has been uh, considered in the Council's recent Strategic Tourism Infrastructure Development Plan, I believe it's called. I've only seen a draft version on it, of it. I'm, I'm not sure if it's been published yet, but, um, but that's only some of the thoughts that were, that were flagged in that. Going on to the lack of tangible remains at uh, the smaller north sites. <clears throat> so that's another challenge that these sites had. They all had reasonably modest physical or tangible remains. However, there was quite a lot of variation between, between the six sites there. Some of them, you could hardly see any remains at all, whereas others, like the St. Michael's Church here in Eaglesey, they're almost, almost full structures. Nevertheless, even if St. Michael's Church, quite a substantial structure for a north site in, site in Orkney, but it may still not offer much incentive for tourists, because the way it works, it's, it's quite a universal phenomenon really at, at destinations that tourists do tend to congregate around a relatively small set of the local attractions. Most tourists do. Uh, and in terms of heritage attractions, it tends to be those with the most impressive physical remains. And there are a few reasons for this. I've kind of listed them there. First of all, tourists just have limited time and limited resources. So they're likely only to become acquainted with a few of the attractions at the destinations generally the biggest and the most conspicuous ones. Also, most tourists prefer the bigger and the more complete physical remains because they make the work of imagination easier. It's easier to 
understand the heritage sites, imagine what it would have been like in the past, if there are many and fairly complete remains that you can see. Uh, and then the last thing is that bigger sites just promise a bigger ratio between transport time and time spent on site. And, and time is a precious resource for tourists. So most of the North sites in Orkney are quite challenged in their appeal because they aren't they aren't that impressive in terms of upstanding remains from a typical tourism point of view. However, this is not particular to Orkney. Um, Viking and Norse heritage tourism, I mean, it's a, it's a huge tourism magnet, the Viking Norse heritage, in many destinations, but it's a kind of tourism that often doesn't really rely primarily on the tangible remains, because like here, those remains are usually not that monumental from this particular period. Instead, you have in, in Scandinavia, but also here in the UK, a lot of things like um, living history museums, biking fairs, um, and these are the kind of initiatives which rely strongly on, on intangible heritage. Um, for instance, through teaching and displaying skills, storytelling, reenactment, and, and these kind of things. So another way to widen the tourism offer and increase dispersal is to consider whether we are exploiting these kind of opportunities sufficiently here in Orkney. Um, so as you can see here on the, on the slide, I'm pointing at the use of the Orkney Inga Saga, for instance, as, as one aspect of this. So the Orkney Inga Saga, if you don't know, is an Icelandic saga written around 1200 about the Norse Earls of Orkney. It's a pretty unique resource, actually, in the national context. You don't find any other part of Scotland that's described in any level of details in, in the Icelandic sagas. Um, and it is used for tourism. It is translated into tourism resource. We, we have the Orkney Inga Saga Centre in Orford. We do have a saga trail, but they're very modest resources with very, very low levels of, of investment, if any. Um, whereas if you look at Iceland, for instance, uh, they use their sagas very, very actively in tourism. Lots of saga trails, lots of saga interpretation centers. They put the saga plays on for visitors. They have entire areas that are marketed only on the role they, they played in a particular saga. So it seems feasible that this is a resource that might be better exploited also here in Orkney. Furthermore, we don't have a great deal of creative or immersive tourism uh, tourism offers related to the North period. Um, like reenactments, engaging visitors in activities or workshops, also digital offers like virtual or augmented reality. We don't really have anything like that. There is a bit um, of Brodka tours. I've done quite a lot of this. Um, but it's not a lot. It's still not a lot, especially not considering the quite extensive relevant human resources that we have that we could use for this, both in terms of the guides, craftspeople, academic experts that, that we actually have on the islands. Um, my guess why this is the case um, is that they do this kind of tourism, immersive and, and creative tourism, does, does present an economic risk to tourism providers. You know, it's, it's, it's a risk to do these kind of new, new and, and resource intensive uh, source of tourism. And the tourism providers frankly don't need to take that risk here in Orkney because we're lucky enough to live in a place where we have a lot of heritage sites that are impressive just by means of their physical nature. You know, you can just take people there and show them, uh, especially the Neolithic and the, the wartime sites. So there's just, as I say, that's little to incentivize the tourism to write, provider to go down a less safe, and more resource intensive route, like, you know, creative uh, or immersive tourism. But if we want more dispersal, um, I think it's one of the things that we'd have to look at. Thirdly, tourism dispersal to the small and north sites is complicated by location and accessibility issues. Um, I already touched on the importance of a good ratio between the resources visitors spend on getting to a site in terms of their time, their money, their energy, and what they gain from the site on the other side. Um, and this ratio, at most of the case study sites, that was they were the ratio was negatively affected by the fact that the sites were often rather time consuming and rather difficult to get to. Um, as for the other aspects, port accessibility can to some extent be amended. Naturally, if a site is on a smaller island, that will always be less accessible for tourists who, for the main part, arrive at Orkney mainland and have their main base on Orkney mainland. So you can't really change that. But accessibility can still be improved a lot by looking at things such as the availability of public transport, 
um, the challenges connected to booking capacity and speed of the inter-island transport, the size of roads and parking spaces, which make many smaller sites practically inaccessible, especially for coach parties. And these factors don't just uh, impede tourism to the north sites, but they're barriers to tourism dispersal in Orkney more generally. Um, this is not news to anybody. <laughs> this is something, you know, the central bodies like Orkney Islands Council, um, Destination Orkney Partnership, they're very perfectly aware of this. And actually just in the few years that I've been writing my thesis, uh, a lot of improvement happened. Um, so for instance, there was the introduction of the road equivalent tariff on the Thailand ferries, so the fares have gone down. Um, there's also the introduction of online booking very recently on Orkney ferries, so that has made the booking process a lot smoother. But a lot of issues around this, you know, around transport and infrastructure in Orkney are still not solved. And they're very difficult to solve because we're talking about public or at least publicly subsidized goods or services. So in tourism studies, this is referred to as the problem of common pool resources, which is basically the problem that many resources used by tourists are free or subsidized common goods, and therefore investment in them necessarily result in a deficit. And actually, the more tourists, the bigger the deficit. And so there's naturally a reluctance and also a lack of funds to undertake those investments. And we can see this in, in Orkney as, as in other places. In some places, a tourism tax has been introduced as a partial solution because that is, um, you know, a public income and that can be used directly on public spending related to the effects of tourism. But as many as you will be aware, the idea of a tourism tax hasn't been very favorably received in Orkney because of a number of complications. Again, this is a whole issue of its own. I'm not really gonna get into it here, but if somebody wants to discuss it, you can bring it up afterwards in the questions and we can have a talk about it. Um, but to get back to the sort of overcoming the, the problem of poor accessibility of these sites, again, I would like to not just look at the supply side, but also at the demand side. Because as I said, yes, these sites are often difficult and time consuming to get to. But again, again, it is possible for us as a destination to lean into that by appealing specifically to tourists who see remoteness and slow travelers as um, qualities in themselves. So we can do that, for instance, by um, do more to develop our active travel infrastructure, cycling and walking paths, and also to a higher degree make, for instance, inter-island travel an experience in itself. And again, some things, during the time time that I've been um, I've been doing this study, some things have been done to that end. Um, so we have the St. Magnus Way, for instance. You can see a little bit of it on my picture there. A pilgrimage route which directs walkers actually to less visited uh, parts of Orkney. There's also been the North Isles Landscape Partnership Scheme, which has a variety of projects. But one of them was, for instance, to make the ferries more visitor friendly, um, have more interpretation on the ferries, more um, interactive activities, and so on. So so there are. There are some things that are being done to this effect in this in this direction. I think we might also want to consider questioning our approach to cruise tourism specifically, because as a visitor group, cruise tourists are just really difficult to disperse, um, especially given the landscape and the infrastructure that we have here in Orkney. Um, so I mentioned earlier that tourists tend to congregate around a few sites because they have limited time and knowledge of the destination. And for cruise tourists, that's that's the case to an extreme degree. You know, they have very little time in a destination, um, so they have little chance to stray far away from the ship. And in Orkney, ninety percent of the ships berth or anchor at Kirkwall, so that means that all these visitors have little chance of getting very far away from that particular area. Um, and they also cannot be expected to have much knowledge of the destination because they encounter a new destination almost on a on a daily basis. So it just makes them much, much more concentrated. And that's especially the case with the larger liners because they can only berth at mainland Orkney and they conduct shore excursions by coach um, which have access to, to much fewer sites. Um, the audience of the smaller, the so-called boutique liners, a uh, slightly different situation. They can be dispersed more widely, both because um, there is a potential and increasing interest in more of these liners going to the smaller islands then we have a whole social sustainability situation around that, as I talked about before, but uh, you know, we can go back to that. Um, but also because these shore excursions from the smaller liners, they go by minibuses and that allow them to go to a much wider choice of, of sites also on mainland. Um, so as a measure to increase dispersal, 
a reduction in megalinus could be could be an option and, and we could do that you know there are tools you could, you could do to control that so that takes us to number four the the better use of the nearby attracts in the environment because i've talked about how it's detrimental to the appeal of a site if it's difficult to get to as well as being small but i imagine many of you have been thinking that well it's unlikely that tourists would for instance go or go through all the trouble to get to a small island to see just one site there so the calculation about you know the calculation between the trouble of getting there and the small time spent seeing it doesn't really add up because it also matters what's around that site you know all the other things you might see when once you get there and that's absolutely right uh, and here Orkney really has an advantage because there's a lot to see in most corners of the archipelago there's a lot of great natural sites and scenery uh, many archaeological sites many heritage sites and also other cultural attractions like heritage centers creative workshops galleries and so on it's very it became very very obvious to me during the um during my research that Orkney and the people in Orkney on all levels really invest very much in the natural and the cultural heritage and landscape that we have but of course the question for me was how to how tourism dispersal could be increased so in other words whether those rich attraction environments in the areas I was looking at could be utilized more than they are present um, and the main potential I found was one of making a coherent whole out of the disparate attractions in any given area. I don't know if disparate is the right way of saying it. You know what I mean. So this photo, uh, for instance, is from the North Settlement on the Bohodianas in the East Mainland. Very small site, but with a good wider attractions environment. So the site is located within the Mulhead Local Nature Reserve. Great walks, very impressive scenery, visitor center and so on. And also in the wider DNS area, you have a campsite, there's a gin distillery, which has tours, cafe, gift shop. Um, you can go on boat trips in DNS, as a glass art workshop. Quite a varied visitor offer, really, especially for, for active visitors. However, for tourists unfamiliar with Orkney, unfamiliar with the area, this is not necessarily very evident because there just isn't any attempt to package those elements into a coherent offer. Uh, for instance, through marketing, um, through connecting digital or physical infrastructure or or just through an actual package tour, you know, for tour companies or show excursion companies or anything like that. And that was the case across several of the areas I looked at. Even when there was a good attractions environment, this was just not necessarily easily accessible to visitors because it wasn't presented as a package and, and some, some elements uh, were just much less evident than others. Um, and I think the reason why this was missing in most areas is most likely that there just wasn't any local bodies for that kind of strategic tourism work. In some of the areas I looked at there was, especially some of the smaller islands, you do sometimes have a local tourism association or you do have a development trust that does that kind of strategic tourism work. And when that happened, you could really see it making a difference. Um, so Papa Westry, for instance, um, has been very good at doing a, a strategic tourism work and you can really see their tourism offer is much more coherent because of it. So that's what I had to say about appeal, I think. In, in summary, the tourism dispersal to the small North heritage sites is certainly challenged by the nature and the accessibility of those sites. Um, and I think it will probably be difficult to change the fact that Orkney as a tourist destination just has some quite clearly defined centers and peripheries. However, that said, my findings also suggested that dispersal rates could be higher than they are present uh, with adaptations on the supply side, on the demand side. Uh, so on the supply side, I've touched on matters relating to, as I've listed here, investment priorities relating to the tourism infrastructure, um, the hour exploitation of the intangible heritage of these sites and creating creative and immersive tourism option, uh, options. Uh, relating to transport infrastructure, the improvements of our transport infrastructure, and relating to the potential creation of more coherent attraction packages um, in, in local areas. Whereas on the demand side, the focus has been on an increased focus on adventure and slow tourism markets uh, in our strategic tourism planning, as well as a potential reduction of megaliners in our visitor composition. So I think that's it for me, really. I've tried to give an idea, first of all, of the sustainability impacts of increased tourism dispersal here in Orkney. And here, 
secondarily the initiatives that would be needed really to make sort of the dispersal come about. I'm aware some of the issues that I'm touching on are sort of contentious. I'm also aware that there's sort of this is an ever moving target. I'm writing about this always development happening. So development happenings in, in developments happening in this area while I was writing. There's certainly still been some after I finished. So maybe some of you will will correct me in some of that. So uh, I'll open the floor to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Annie. Lots of really interesting stuff there. I've got no doubt we've got lots of questions from members of the audience. And there's actually already been a few submitted while you were talking there. Um, the first is from Fran. A uh, question related to what you've said about the political will for tourism dispersal. Do you think that the bigger sites have a positive role to play in spreading the visitors to other sites? And can they do that without jeopardising their own position? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think there's a lot of... Because the history means that all the sites are obviously connected. So yeah, I think a lot could be done in that respect, actually, that you know you can you can use the sites that we always have, like our flagship sites, to draw attention to all the other sites and to kind of and to the history between them. So Fran, for instance, you know, we have the cathedral, evidently, which could be part of the whole um strengthening the intangible the intangible North uh, North history that we have. The Orkney and Gasaga, for instance, and just making that stronger, the cathedral could be a, a very important part of that. Just, um, so you, you think that could be a, a kind of symbiotic relationship? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sites. Okay. Yeah, that would be that would be an obvious way to do it. Okay. Um, another question from Lynn. Um, at today's destination Orkney tourism conference, it was agreed that uh, quantity was better than quality. As such, if we can only concentrate on one site. Which one do you think would benefit from further interpretation, VR, etc.? It was agreed that quantity was better than quality. Apparently, yep. Okay, so uh, sorry that that just distracted me so much. I didn't I didn't hear the rest. Sorry. <laughs> what was the question? That's okay. I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, yeah. At today's destination Orkney tourism conference, it was agreed that quantity um, was better than quality. Sorry. It helps if I read it properly, I think. Um, quality <laughs> um, quality is better than quantity. Oh, right. That such. makes more sense. If we can, <laughs> if we can only concentrate on uh, on one site, which one do you think would benefit from further interpretation, VR, etc.? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good question. Hmm. I think, well, if I just take from my from the six case study sites I was looking at, sure. I think the one that I would choose to work on, I would say the area I would choose to work on would probably be DNS. Okay. Because as I was just talking about, I think the not the site in itself, but just the area as such, you know, the whole package together. There's also work going on at Newark and so on. That area could I think a lot could be done with that actually. Um, it has a very interesting tourism offer that's being um, that's not being utilized very much, whereas it doesn't have as many challenges, especially in terms of the infrastructure that many of the other sites do, um, because that, that, that is a massive problem with a lot of them. It's, it's just the infrastructure. So I would say from the six sites I was looking at, if if you ask me which one of them do you think we could develop right now with the least problems, I would say that one, I would say DNS. So is that simply because it is kind of an easier option or is there something at DNS that you think? Yes, it's upon? because there aren't, there aren't the problems that are going to be very, very difficult to overcome and some of the others, especially in terms of the infrastructure, also because there were a lot of, um, there were also a lot of the local actors that were very keen on actually developing their local tourism offer. And it just kind of, it just needed that, the kind of working, putting things together. Mm. I think, I think there was just kind of, it felt like a more low hanging fruit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, interestingly, on that point of kind of community engagement, um, Liz has asked a question there about are there any lessons to be learned from other tourist uh, tourist destinations, sorry, uh, that are sinking under the numbers of cruise tourists like Venice? That are, sorry? 
Um, are there any lessons to be learned from other tourist destinations that are sinking under the numbers of cruise tourists, places like Venice? That are sinking? Just the end. Under. Of, oh, okay, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Sinking, yeah. Yes, I think that's a very interesting question because, I mean, our numbers are nowhere near, nowhere near what they are at Venice in terms of, you know, the, the ratio between, and even, even nowhere near what they have in some places in Norway. You know, well, so we're in a much better position in that sense. But that's why we have to act now, because you don't want to do it when you're in that situation where Venice is now. Mm. You know, you kind of at that at that stage it's almost too late. You know, they're kind of they're acting now in Venice. That's fine, but but so much has happened. You know, that there's been disastrous results also for their just for their general reputation. You know. This is what you know about Venice now. Yeah. These are these are the pictures that you have in your head. And also it's kind of that's also why I'm trying to talk about social sustainability and cruise tourism, because it's not only a matter of it's also a matter of what are people happy what kind of society are people happy to live in, you know? If if a lot of people in the community feels that 3,000 people are too many in a day, then we have to take that seriously. Then that's unsustainable. You know, even if a place like Venice has, you know, 2,000 as many, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, it, it's not a question of numbers. It's, it's a question of the people who live here, you know, it's mm. a question of what, what will work for this community. And is there any kind of kind of living forum whereby there is kind of regular pulse speeds taken from the community to to gauge what their attitudes are to In things Orkney? Like Yeah. Not that I know of. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um just to open the floor again if anyone wants to fire any questions into the chat. I think that's us at the bottom there. So I think um this is usually where I've used my position and ask all of my ridiculous questions. Um, oh, Chris has got in there before me. Uh, so a question from Chris. Uh, I work as a psychology professor and visited Orkney in October from the States to do research um, at uh, Queen uh, Neolithic site. I was very struck by the Norse presence throughout Kirkwall. I had a chance to go to the cathedral and visit uh, with Annie for a few minutes. From an outsider's perspective, I would return to Orkney for the Norse sites. I wonder if there's a way to have more of a centralised web presence showcasing the Norse sites, or even a wraparound tour of both the Norse and the Olympic sites. Mm. More of a centralised web presence for mm. the Norse for the Norse heritage. It's a really interesting idea. I think, I think the challenge would be, who would do it? <laughs> who would be responsible for it? Um, because it just takes. I think the problem we have had with a lot of the initiatives, with a lot of the tourism initiatives, um, is that you tend to get the grant funding, the initial grant funding, but not maintenance funding. So mm -hmm. you could probably, you know, probably the Institute for Northern Studies would be able to get grant funding for something like this and yeah. set it up. But if you don't have the ongoing maintenance funding, you, you have a problem, especially with digital resources, because it just outdates so quickly. And then you end up with, you know, kind of half dead and outdated websites, which mm -hmm. isn't really. So you need to have a body which which would be prepared and would have the resources to keep it going mm -hmm. um, all the time. And I think that's, that's the main challenge we have. Also in terms of what I was talking about, you know, kind of immersive and, and uh, you know, augmented or virtual reality. So it's also really interesting options, but problematic for the same reason, you know, because you need ongoing investments in it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, so, so uh, I would say that's, that's the main problem I would see with that because otherwise it's a very, it's a yeah. very um, interesting. I guess it doesn't get around the kind of the issues with transport and accessibility as well, um, which would still be kind of barriers that you need to, to look into. Um, there's been the, the recent Pictish Trail um, in the North Scotland and it was National Lottery funding, I think, um, and they've kind of developed this this app that you log into and the idea is very similar to, you know, to encourage 
people to go? Is that maybe something that could be looked at for Orkney? Or do you think that the issues over accessibility and some of the other issues that you, you flagged there, are they barriers that make the Orkney situation unique and need to be tackled in a slightly different way? Uh, no, I think definitely we certainly, but we have quite a lot of walking trails. I think we should be aware of that as well. So not to kind of, I think you don't want to overflood the market mm. <laughs> because we have a, you know, we have um, the Orkneyology walking trail on the West west uh, mainland. And we now have the, um, um, as I said, the St. Magnus Way. We have the Heritage Trail in, um, within Kirkwall. There's one in the Mullhead as well. It's, I'm sure there's one more. So we should, that's something to be aware of as well, that it can just, you know, if you want to do it, you, you need to do that well. You need to make one that's better than all the others, at least. Yeah. Um, and as, as I said, make sure it's a body that can keep it going, you know, that can keep maintain it over time. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, you know, it just, I think I think you just risk it, it being just like I said with all the dead, dead websites, you can just end up being having a lot of dead apps because everybody's like, oh, we can make a trail app, and then it just kind of becomes something that's yeah. not maintained itself. So, so we we have to be careful that it also quality products that we do. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but otherwise it's a it's a great idea because as I talked about, you know, active travel that that taps in with a really good market mm -hmm. and it would disperse people. So so from that point of view, it's a really great idea. And I was also saying like the St. Magnus Way, for instance, was, has been very successful and the people mm -hmm. in Eglisey, for instance, saying, yeah, it's, it's brought a lot of, it's brought a lot more tourists over there. Um, but you just need good. to have, have some good people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously you don't want, because there's so many of these dead sites, right, where you get the initial fund and it gets off the ground, but then like you say, these things cost money and that's often where these things fall through and it's no good if it's just going to offer you a, a year of security. You really need long term uh, investment. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. So Linda actually uh, linking into that point, uh, she was asking whether there was scope to set up a, a Norse heritage walking trail. Um, so I think the, the consensus is there is, but we, we just need to be careful about the surrounding market. Uh, mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then Philip's got a question. I, I wonder if Brexit has influenced tourism, particularly from the EU um, in Orkney or, or seasonal workers working in tourism and cultural industries. Has that been an issue or not at all? Well, I tried to look into this and there isn't, there's very little data on it yet because of COVID, because COVID mm -hmm. happened. So it's been very difficult to know what was Brexit and what wasn't. Um, the theories that have come out is that po probably it would result in less European tourism, Brexit, um, and but more more domestic tourism. Mm -hmm. That that's likely what will happen. But but that theory is that said that there's it's not very much evidence based because by the time that Brexit was completed, COVID came really. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> so there isn't really any kind of very reliable data on it. Yeah, and then COVID had a similar kind of effect, right? Where you would assume that more people from well, exactly. would, yeah, exactly. precisely, precisely, yeah, yeah. Um, we've got another question from uh, Fran. Um, oh, she's made a very good point here, actually. Um, that the apps, etc., also depend on there being strong mobile signal, uh, and that's yeah, not yeah. always the case in the remote areas. Yeah. That has been a problem because often it relies on you downloading it before you yeah. get to the actual site. So yeah, that has been a problem for many of the apps in, in Orkney. Yeah. But you have to know about it before you go to the actual site where you have to use it. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I think there was a, I can't remember what the, the exact island, but there was one on uh, in the Western Isles where they were using the QR codes. But the issue was that some mobile providers just didn't have signal. Uh, so the QR code was no use because people still couldn't access it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a really important point. Um, there, we do still have some time if anyone has any other questions that they are are setting up. Uh, we've got another one from uh, Claudia. Uh, you mentioned the more specialised tourist groups who prefer the less built up sites with more scope for their imagination. You also mentioned the beautiful surroundings as the whole package. Perhaps it would be an option to link those sites to more nature sightseeing 
but make them part of a day hike, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very good point um, to have more. Also, because as I said, many of the heritage tourists now are not just heritage tourists. <laughs> so, so yeah, it would be a very good option to have these packages. This is kind of what I was talking about in the end, to try to make more coherent packages. So make it clearer to people that you can, if you go to this peripheral area, you have these incredible nature offers and these incredible heritage sites, and you can kind of have Dole in this area. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes that's um, that's less clear. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'll just, uh, I'll give it a, a minute or so in case anyone's furiously uh, typing away there. I suppose, Annie, if I could ask you a hypothetical question, um, you know, if if someone was to give you, you know, a, a bag full of cash, and told you that you can, you know, you have to use this to improve Norse heritage in Orkney, what would be the most effective way to do that? Out with, you know, kind of completely revising transport links and things like that. I think. Probably I've come around to the idea that it might have been a good idea to make something actually central about, you know, maybe a centre in Kirkwall or Stromness or somewhere central as a starting point. Right. To, 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 to give an introduction to the Norse heritage, to, for instance, to the Orkney Inga saga. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a bigger saga centre than, than we have. And then through that, give people an, an introduction, yeah, to that kind of heritage and then spread them out from that starting point. In the beginning, I was like, well, that's just going to get more people into, into Kirkwall, but, but you're not going to start them off by sending them out to a site that's far away if they don't have any initial interest. So I think that that would probably be the way to go. Yeah, so almost like also in Kirkwall. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. yeah, very important for the weather, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think actually that would be that is probably the most reasonable solution, okay. And how much buy in do you think you would need from kind of local tour providers in Orkney? Because you know, in Orkney, there's you know, there's hundreds of these small uh tour providers. Um, and there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no kind of oversight for this. Um, no, no, no. How much kind of negotiation and coordination would you need from them to help with this dispersal? Well, it's incredibly important that, you know, everybody's kind of on board with this. That's, as I was talking about, for instance, I was talking about Iceland and how the sagas has become much more of a tourism attraction there than it is here, but that's also because all the small, all the individual stakeholders give people that visit an impression that the sagas are a big deal, you know? Yeah. You come across it in all the shops, you come across it with, when you talk to the guides, you come across, everybody agrees on it, so it kind of becomes a self-perpetuating prophecy. Yeah. So, you know, if, if we don't have, if we don't get stakeholders here, the different tourism stakeholders in Orkney, Whatever they be, you know, the, the tour guides and the, the, the people in the eye center and, and, you know, all the way up and down. If you don't get people to kind of cooperate on this, then it's not going to work. Mm. You know, it's just, you, know, you, you can't just do it top down, make a marketing strategy, and this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, couple of just comments there. Um, just uh, Alex saying, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk, Annie. Uh, Fran saying, great talk. Um, I think your points about intangible heritage are really important. Uh, things like storytelling, poetry have an important role to play, absolutely. Uh, and Liz just saying, very uh, comprehensive and interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, unless we've got um, a last question firing in there, um, I will bring things to close just as we hit the, the quarter past mark. Uh, just in case someone is furiously smashing their keyboard, I think we're probably okay. Okay, well, um, 
Before I bring matters to a close, can I just ask you that everyone joins me in the traditional awkward uh, online round of applause for uh, Annie's talk and our incredible generosity in, the, in that discussion, which was very interesting as well. So thank you very much, Annie. <laughs> thank you. I, I promise everyone else is clapping at the same time. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, for everyone in the audience, uh, that was our last seminar of uh, this semester's uh, series, but don't fear, we'll be back in the new year where we'll be kicking off with a really interesting paper from Dr Adrian Maldonado from the National Mu Museum of Scotland, who will be discussing Viking Age reuse of insular metalwork from Northern Britain. And that will take place at the usual time of seven o'clock on the 23rd of February. So until then, thank you all for attending tonight. Thanks again to Annie for a fantastic paper. And uh, from everyone here at INS, I wish you a restive festive break and a very happy new year when it comes. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Annie.